My lord, the newer, more indestructible Death Star is nearly complete. Soon, we will return to our dominance of the galaxy, and the retro station will be obliterated. Ah, yes. And those wretched teddy bears who aided those frigging rebels in destroying our last indestructible Death Star? Incinerated in Project Incinerator. And that coward Piet? Died by his own foolishness. Speaking his name without derisive laughter is now a capital crime. What about those two engineers who failed to install the OSHA recommended handrails in my throne room? They have been remanded to a job more suited to their talents. Good. Good. <laughs> So, we're just supposed to stand here? Pretty cushy job. <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> the dark side is so cool. Get upset on the internet. Hi everybody, welcome to Retro Station 1989. I'm Commander Dan and this is the Retro Station. Filled to the brim with retro video games and this is licensed to play. See, this is our evaluation show, review show of retro stuff that's based on licensed properties. Movies, TV shows, comic books. Hell, if it had a license and it was retro, we review it. Today, we are continuing Action Month, actually concluding Action Month and jumping into our next month, which I'll announce right at the end. Uh, today, everyone has an opinion on this works license, okay? I mean, it's a science fiction action fantasy saga and while there are many many retro games based on today's property and so many people reviewing everything based on this license from the comics to the films to the tv shows animated series and hell even a long lost bootlegged holiday special has been dissected mocked in some cases appreciated and moreover the commercials from that special have been reviewed and mocked and uh, somewhat appreciated. I mean, I think you clicked on the title. You know what we're talking about today. I won't pretend you don't know which license we're talking about. But it's going to be a confrontational, personal, bumpy ride. Fire up the footage, Cambot Jr. 1977. I was two years old. Look at me. At two years old, I only knew one thing. I was going to grow up to be best friends with Fozzie Bear. Because I was going to move to Sesame Street and be a Muppet for a living. In 1982, my dad bought a VHS recorder and player. We were living on post in Germany. And we watched two movies that changed my life. E.T. and The Empire Strikes Back. My pop had been given them somehow when we watched a very special edition of both. An edition with people in the foreground getting up to get popcorn and soda. So let's just say not an official release. So at age 7... Commander Dan knew two things. I was going to grow up and live on Sesame Street with puppets, and I was going to do it as a goddamn space trucker like my hero, Han Solo. And from that moment in 1982, I was obsessed with Star Wars. Toys, color forms, coloring books, toys, board games, toys, and of course, the movies and video games. And toys. We finally owned Star Wars on VHS in 1984, along with Empire and Jedi. I think that's when it was. And while other toys held my attention, only video games and Star Wars were a must-have at every birthday and Christmas moving forward. That tradition goes on today. Now I want you to understand, every birthday and Christmas since 1982, I've gotten one Star Wars thing or another. I haven't held on to them forever. I mean, <laughs> that's 40 years of collecting, but... There have been times when I've had to get rid of part of my collection. But I have been a fanatic since I was a small child. I'm fluent in Orabesh, as well as most of the trade languages of the criminal syndicates, including the upstart Crimson Dawn trash. Commander Dan grew up loving Star Wars, like some folks love the Bible, or their children, or their spouses. And this time, your commander is going to take his time with this one to set the record straight and evaluate the hell out of a Star Wars licensed game. So today we talk about Star Wars here on the Retro Station and I'm passionate about the subject. 
I've long been a part of Quora. It's a place where people ask questions about shit like Star Wars. And uh, I answer questions about Star Wars for fun. Um, and I've been holding back for a long time on this particular subject. And if you think you're a Star Wars fan, you're, you're a real fan of Star Wars, you may find yourself today offended, angry, full of hate, seething with unbridled rage. The path of the dark side, that is, my space pirates. So trust your commander. Before I begin, and I will, shatter your expectations and your preconceived notions about me and that saga, understand here, right now, that I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying I have an opinion. And my opinion is right. I kid, I kid. Only a Sith deals in absolutes, right? How hilarious. What a hack Lucas is. Doesn't he know saying that only Sith is an absolute? I mean, the guy's a moron. Thank God he'll never create an entire universe from whole cloth for all of us. And create a fandom that stands as one of the biggest testaments to the power of imagination. Thank God his influence in Hollywood is no longer there. First off, allow your commander to ask you to consider why you find Obi-Wan's statement internally inconsistent rather than axiomatic. That means rather than it's kind of a thing you would say that is a little bit inconsistent, but it isn't actually wrong. Now, I know the answer for millions of people. Literally, 10 million or more people will be because the Plinkett reviews of the prequels were hilarious. And they were. No argument. I, I laugh my ass off when I watch them. And I watch them every once in a while just to get a good chuckle. But Mike's points were scripted. Mike's points were just him having a monologue at you. Like this is. But I'm telling you what I'm doing, okay? This is my opinion. They were designed to back an opinion of a bitter Trekkie that Star Wars was and still is more beloved a property than Star Trek ever was. I happen to like both. And his point was to try and harm Star Wars. It's true. Remember the first time you watch it and he oh so cleverly asks people at random to describe characters from the prequels. And the consensus among these random people was that they were describing the character of Princess Amidala. That task seemed impossible. Wow, sure seems like random normies, the man or woman on the street, found characters like Padme bland, obscure, and damn near impenetrable. I didn't find her impenetrable. Ew. Shut up, you. Don't help. You're not helpful. Ew. Sadly, no. He asked the cast of Best of the Worst and Half in the Bag to describe what he thought about these characters. You know, his comrades in film criticism to give their unbiased, quote, opinion, unquote. You may not have noticed that, but your brain did. <laughs> I'm not good at doing a Plinket voice. So this established the kind of hateful, arch, insincere, and bad faith review that we have to wallow in here on the internet. The insincere, disingenuous bullshit where the reviewer pretends things that are obvious from context are confusing or poorly written especially by omitting scenes that provide context and arguing that since it's an opinion, it can't be argued, and lies of omission are just taken as opinion. I disagree with that video. I find it funny. And again, I love the Plinket reviews because they're hysterically funny. They're filthy and don't give a shit about Star Wars fans. But let's go back around. When Obi-Wan says only a Sith deals in absolutes, it's in a moment before a life-or-death fight with his brother-in-arms, his best friend, is about to take place, and is saying, in the context of the scene, only a truly fallen Jedi deals in these kinds of absolutes. Only the Sith think you need to murder each other to get this taken care of. Obi-Wan would say that, because you've had six movies almost to figure out how Obi-Wan thinks. Only a truly fallen Jedi deals in these kinds of absolutes. Only the Sith think you need to murder each other to get this taken care of. Obi-Wan would say that, because you've had six movies almost to figure out how Obi-Wan thinks. Obi-Wan is the master of ambivalence. 
He's ambivalent about the truth of Vader as a Sith. I mean, come on, Space Pirates. It's the primary plot of the original trilogy. Vader killed your father. What I told you was true from a certain point of view. There's even a really cool Robot Chicken song about that. I love it. I think it's funny. It mocks what seem to be plot inconsistencies, but it doesn't do so in a way that tries to burn Star Wars down. You probably get that. But if you need movies to remind you of things you already know or explain contextual clues to you, maybe Star Wars is a little too fast or highbrow and smart for you, kid. <laughs> or maybe, maybe we're all enthralled by a bunch of witty and manipulative sentiments spewed by a pack of professional haters. So I'm not a Sith, or a movie snob, or a hipster wishing that something I hated was destroyed. Even though I hate what the Plinket Reviews did to justify hatred and slander of not just Star Wars, but its creator, a hero of mine, and allowed the real Phantom Menace to infiltrate the fandom of Star Wars. The fans. If you saw the last episode, you know that Margot asked me to review Enter the Matrix. You know, and I love that movie. I have a soft spot for the game. I mean, it's playable, and like Star Wars, it seems like the original film has dedicated fans, and the three follow on sequels of that movie have created a schism in the fan base. A lot like Star Commander Danderson. Yes. <laughs> You know I've come to a revelation. In all of these evaluations of licensed video games, you've very rarely evaluated a truly horrifyingly terrible title. You've never tested yourself against pure trash. Why are you talking like that, Margot? Commander Danderson. It occurs to me you must be afraid of terrible licensed titles. And so, I am choosing your next evaluation based upon this realization. Whoa! As Commander, a.k.a. Commandar, of this retro station, I pick the evaluations. In all of these evaluations, I pick those. All right? You know, you don't tell me what to... Communication terminated. You know, between you and me, I think showing uh, Marco those movies was a bad idea. Oh. All right, on to the next segment, Cambot. Let's talk Star Wars. Okay, that's enough of that. <laughs> I can't play this music. Oh, wait. Yeah, I can. Watch. I'll do it sneaky. There we go. Star Wars is a favorite point of discussion for me in my real life, next to superheroes. And the saga's story has enthralled me since I was two. <laughs> it's true. I saw the commercials for Star Wars. I didn't know what it was. I saw in the news how Darth Vader would be at our local grocery store, and I begged my mom not to get groceries that week. And that's also true. So let's go over the story a little bit. Okay, it's a tale of an ancient order of knights, protectors of peace in a time of decadence and hubris. Their leadership believes that the Jedi Knights, the good guys, to be the only sentient beings available who can utilize a mysterious power called the Force, and they're unmatched in their power and their rightness in using that power for good. During this time, a mysterious evil from their past is rising. Over the many years, their ancient foe, the Sith, have blinded the Jedi to their very existence, and more treacherous, and oh, insidious, you'll get that in a minute, have used their dark rites and practices to dull the abilities of the Jedi to sense the future, and sense the rise of their hidden cult's power. So powerful are these evil Sith and the hidden ones that its leader has attempted to violate the very laws of the living force and manifest a being of pure dark side energy to serve as a vessel for the monstrous villain. But the force does what it will, and even though they broke the entirety of the living force, 
Something happened that the Sith didn't intend with their meddling. It did manifest a being. However, instead of manifesting a being of pure evil, or pure good, the Force because the Force seeks balance, it created a living being and a virgin woman. A rare being known as a virgins. A mortal being created to serve as a conduit for all of the Force, the light and the dark side. A being of portent, fate, power, and destiny. It seems the will of the Force also placed this entity on the very edge of known space in the Outer Rim, leaving it out of the grasp of the Jedi or the Sith, as the Force seeks balance in its natural state. So, this Virgins was meant to be the final piece of the puzzle that balances the Force. And that's how the first story of the Star Wars saga begins, with this unique being in those unique times, and it's called Star Wars, Episode 1, The Phantom Menace. That's right. This episode is dedicated to this game. Star Wars The Phantom Menace for the play PlayStation 1. The game is based on the first Star Wars film to break the fan base of Star Wars. But that's really only true from a certain point of view. Let's take a look. The franchise known as Star Wars began in 1977, and its creator George Lucas was more interested in cinematic technique and innovation to begin with, but was given the unique opportunity to create a story of his own making to try and entertain a completely cynical world of the late 70s. Lucas wanted to create a fantasy tale with a brand new aesthetic, a science fantasy high concept setting, but told a classic tale of swashbuckling adventure with broad characters, but with Ralph McQuarrie and his trusted advisors. These are also people who trimmed back his ideas, turned his dense and opaque uh, story about the Wills, that's W-H-I-L-L-S, huh, into Star Wars. No episode number in the first movie, because it was a slice of his personal universe. He also didn't think it would succeed. So it was just a, the, the best part, the best chance, actually, of the saga connecting with people that had enough action and plot intrigue to allow new people into his universe. And after a crazy, like, diabolical shooting experience, much like Jaws, a blockbuster was born. In fact, it molded American cinema. Summertime is for blockbuster movies. Some would say for the worse, actually. Kind of like Titanic. How they manipulated young ladies to go see the movie at Christmas time. Because what else were you going to do at Christmas time? Avatar was released around the same time. But that's the thing about George Lucas. He created a path for independent cinema. Yeah, he sold toys. Millions and millions of toys. And made billions. And billions of dollars that he gave to charity. But it was all to fund his technologically advanced special effects crew, industrial light and magic. He created Steadicam for fuck's sake, mastered the green screen, created Pixar, he pioneered the very art of cinema, and now his career boils down to this? What's wrong with your face? Because of the Plinkett reviews, and all the haters, including myself, that were seduced by what is basically the dark side of fandom. I don't blame Mike Stoklasa, I don't. Or the Red Letter Media crew. I'm a fan of theirs. I'm still a fan of theirs right now today. I blame something else. And here's where I'm going to lose what few subscribers or fans I may or may not have. Open communication hello to the Palpatine residents on Coruscant. Life day. What a bunch of Wookiee cookies. I can't believe this year. Oh, Trooper, TK-102. How is everything at my granddaughter's home? Is the child secure? Uh, holy shit. I, I mean, yes, my emperor. Everything is fine. Your granddaughter and her husband are celebrating Life Day, yodeling along with a recording of the Rebel Leo Organa. Sounds like a real spice girl if you get my drift, emperor. Oh, I know. All her spacist cultural appropriation, that Wookiee Life Day stuff. Just because a boyfriend married a Wookiee, I don't... I don't think they're married, sir. Apparently, the criminal Han Solo finagled a life debt with a Wookiee Hey, and... do I look like food and beads third frigging head over here? Besides, how is the... <laughs> Child. That was spooky. Uh, 
The infant is with the paddle droids from the maternity ward. You know, the ones with the... Yeah, they still have those? I thought I outlawed them after the accident with Lord Vader's... Uh, <laughs> after all the mishaps with the shaken infant syndrome. Well, Naboo is kind of old-fashioned, my lord. Shall I bring your daughter and her husband to the screen? No. Uh, in fact, send along my best wishes and this recording of my Life Day greetings to them. Now, which buttons send the... Excellent, my Emperor Palpatine. It's the file labeled secret plan to stuff my soul into my granddaughter Ray, and not a hideous monster goblin or gross old man for once. Right? What? No, that's my secret plan to usurp control of Ray's body. Do not send and that... And sent. You dumb mother... F Commander Dan Durson. That seems pretty far-fetched. Of course you're right, but it sure seems more likely than what we're told in the last movie of the new series, right? Palpatine would rather come back as a giant tumor mutant in a smoking jacket or a robot zombie with a permanent rod up his ass than just create other virgins in the Force like Anakin or Rey, right? Affirmative. Those movies are all over the place, Commander. Oh, I'm back. Wow, how did you know explaining the new trilogy of Star Wars movies would snap me out of it? If anything will make you question the reality you live in, it's those three fucking movies. So it's 1993 and I graduated high school. In that year, George Lucas let it slip on an E.T. interview. That's Entertainment Tonight, not this guy. We'll get to him later. He said, enough of the world of special effects had advanced to allow him to get finished working on the rest of Star Wars. And that meant, first, episodes one through three. Prequels? We were going to get to see the Clone Wars? Anakin and Obi-Wan fighting alongside one another? We get to find out more about Obi-Wan? Yoda? Oh my god, hell to the yes. Also, the fans of that day didn't really feel like episodes seven through nine were all that needed just yet as Lucas had overseen a trilogy of books by Timothy Zahn that were, and hear this, canon. My cat's name is Mara Jade. That is the end of that fact. I want you to know that Timothy Zahn created characters and moments that were canon. Let that sink in. That was real to me. Thrawn, Mara Jade, Talon Card, the Wild Card, Isalamiri, Female Jedi... The tragic story of Leia, Lady Vader. Look, those novels have been cannibalized for years for ideas. All the way from the most recent Star Wars episode. George, I mean, <laughs> he let Timothy Zahn create things that were so amazing. For example, Google, the Katana Fleet, and Heir to the Empire. For why your faithful commander ain't mad at the ending of Rise of Skywalker. I see what's happening. George let them slay the dragon, and now as they're feasting upon the meat and bones, I recognize that meat. I recognize those bones. And I raise a glass to what was once was. But today, we're talking about the Phantom Menace. And the first tidbit leaked out in 93, I was heading to college, which I paid for, by the way, with every toy I collected from the time I was five. That's right, my first semester of college is paid for by all my toys. And I followed every snack-sized tidbit rolling out over the brand new internet on Ain't It Cool News. I picked up Star Wars magazine. In the late 90s, I worked as a movie theater as a projectionist just for the hopes of catching the first glimpses of in inside info from Star Wars. Luckily, I was a projectionist, so I got to do a couple cool things. So, it's November of 98. This is many years later. Um, I'm a grown-ass man. I've already had a son, a divorce, and I'm working still in a movie theater as a projectionist. And a movie that I had happened to be an extra in while living in Orlando, The Waterboy, was going to release. Now, you can't see me in the movie, I don't think. I've tried to find myself. I'm wearing a Shazam shirt. So if you see a guy at the end of the movie, it's the Citrus Bowl stuff, and you see a dude in a Shazam shirt, that was me. I never made it on the field. My buddy Joe did, though. Um... And <laughs> the teaser trailer was attached to the Waterboy. 
I think that's why Adam Sandler has a major career. I mean, the teaser trailer was to be attached to Waterboy, and only the Waterboy and two other movies, like The Siege and another one. And the people from 20th Century Fox sent representatives there to collect all the spare frames from splicing the trailer to the main uh, print of the Waterboy. They sat through Waterboy with us that night, too, when we tested the print and we proofed the film. And the teaser was magnificent. A minute and 45 seconds, probably, of intrigue, mystery, and finally, Star Wars content new from the creator himself, George Lucas. I was lucky enough to see it before the general public. The teaser was released on StarWars.com and downloaded 10 million times. Almost as many times as the Red Letter Media propaganda used as a cudgel against Lucas until he was chased away from creating for the public at all. <laughs> They've been downloaded and laughed at so many times. And people were hyped for that movie, The Phantom Menace. And it was just a teaser. It wasn't the trailer. When you see this, and you should seek it out for yourself, I'll, I'll show you a couple scenes from it. But it's nuts. So the movie came out in May of the following year. That was 1999. And the hip take was, of course, that the new movies weren't as good. <laughs> the end of the 90s is all about counterintuitivity and irony and sarcastic and hard truth takes about classic franchises and properties. Like this. Now, I don't blame Clerks. Again, I love the creator of Clerks, Kevin Smith. I blame the assholes who don't get the joke. That Randall is an asshole. Not that George Lucas is a hack. The movie's easy to explain, and I'll do it right now. Pretend like you don't get it, and you're just pretending like you don't get it. This is the movie. The Sith have been clouding the power of the Jedi to see the future, so the Jedi are relying on prophecies, the past, and their senses of the now to compensate. The Jedi are numerous and very, very, very arrogant. And the dark side takes advantage of the fear the Jedi Order have of announcing their weakness. This is all told through dialogue. Now that's the plot. The story is this. A powerful politician faction called the Trade Federation is blockading all trade routes to Naboo, which could be seen as an act of war and invasion. Doing so, they provoke the Queen, Amidala, and her government to demand assistance with this issue from the Republic. The Senate of the Republic decides to send negotiators to initiate a peace settlement. This is one of the movie's missteps, I think. They use trade routes, taxation, and other, not necessarily topical words, but more what you'd hear on the nightly news words in the opening crawl. And this has to do with George Lucas being given 100% full reign on this. And he's even said the, the, the script writing is not his strong suit. But anyway... They send a pair of Jedi Knights instead of regular ambassadors, believing something strange to be happening. This also happens in Episode 4, when we realize if this is a consular ship, where is the ambassador? It's to reflect that time is an echo of itself. Similar situations. Ambassadors arrive, but they're not ambassadors. Okay. Go watch the Red Letter Media uh, response to the Ring Theory. And then read The Ring Theory also. Do both. Believe what you want. Because it's important. The Jedi Knight starship is obliterated, and the Trade Federation representatives try to assassinate the Jedi at the orders of Darth Sidious. But the Nemoidians fail. The Jedi escape to the planet's surface to warn the Naboo that any request for negotiation is a trap, and full invasion of the planet is already underway. Oh my god, are you watching the news today? Does any of this sound familiar? Is this exactly how invasions take place in the real world? Seems like George Lucas isn't necessarily a hack more than he is a nerd about history. Because the Weimar Republic's rumblings about Venice and Italy before the rise of Hitler plays into this. Moving on. Meanwhile, the Senate hearing over the phone, basically, doesn't believe the escalation is happening. So the Queen insists to go to Coruscant while there's an invasion and give live witness to the illegal war on her planet. And, as is the future Emperor's intent, get her to vote for no confidence in Chancellor Valorum and insists on Palpatine to run the show. These candy asses need to be taken out and we need strong leadership who knows exactly what to do. 
only Emperor Palpatine could fix it. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, Chancellor Palpatine can fix it. After breaking the blockade, the heroes find themselves hiding on Tatooine to repair the ship that was damaged in the impenetrable blockade and meet Anakin Skywalker, the Virgins in the Force, a Force-adept child who's enslaved to Watto the Toydarian, along with his mother. Master Qui-Gon realizes Anakin is powerful enough in the Force to pilot racing pods and build them and droids and tests his midichlorians, proving him to be not only Force-sensitive, as most children, but more powerful than Master Yoda, or potentially. The heroes parlay for Anakin's freedom by betting on Anakin to win the Bunta Eve pod race. There's this really clever bit in the Red Letter Media review of The Phantom Menace where he clips together all of these unrelated lines to make it sound like the bit between Qui-Gon and Watto is confusing and hard to follow. Well, it's not. Here's the bet. Qui-Gon says... I will bet that the boy wins the pond race. I'll put up my own racer if you put up the entrance fee and we'll use both against the boy's freedom when he wins. I'll give you the pod racer, you collect the winnings, and we get the boy. What part of this was hard to fucking understand? Yeah. You may not have noticed that that seemed weird. But your brain did! Thank you, Splat. After the race... Master Qui-Gon is attacked by Darth Maul, the Sith, and they narrowly escape to Coruscant. He barely escapes. And where Amidala is manipulated into ousting the old Chancellor and getting a new one that more closely aligns with Naboo's concerns, they find out that it doesn't matter. The Senate works against everyone. It's actually corrupted to the point where everything is slowed to nearly a stop. They return to Naboo, and the Jedi let her know that they're just cops. They can't fight a war for her because there's only two of them and what they decide to do is enlist the aid of the Gungans and their national police force and their basic air guard to put up a defense of the capital while Amidala and the Jedi attempt to take the Nemoidian leaders hostage to end the conflict they succeed turning the Nemoidians plans against them in fact using their very plan to win that's pretty clever Unless you've watched the Plinkett reviews and think that there's nothing of substance in this movie. There are losses in this war, of course. Mostly on the side of the Naboo. Their uh, guardians, police squad, basically, and their air guard die, fighting off the massive Trade Federation. And Darth Maul succeeds in killing a Jedi. Probably more than the Sith have done in centuries. Obi-Wan promises to train Anakin because Qui-Gon begs him to see that he's the answer to bringing balance to the Force. And while Obi-Wan believes that balance meaning to be eradicate the Sith, I think we all know, who have had the hindsight of looking at the first three movies, that that wasn't the case. Balance to the Force meant both sides are equal. And that was nowhere near the case in The Phantom Menace. And that's it. That's the story of The Phantom Menace. People love this movie. Still do. I do. <laughs> and I don't love it, love it. I, I love it because of what it was. And I'll explain that. But popular opinion, of course, is that it's garbage. I'm going to ask you to do something scary for the internet. I want you to decide for yourself. But while this movie has problems, and I'll go into those, I happen to love it. I would say like it, but no, I'm not going to be embarrassed that I love The Phantom Menace for many reasons. Let's talk about those reasons in a bit. This time, we're evaluating Star Wars The Phantom Menace for the Sony PlayStation. And believe me, I understand that the task I'm undertaking would go thankless and a little frustrating for people, but I am at my breaking point already with all the hog shit being spread, even today, that the idiots who bray like jackasses at Mead Spirited Reviews that bullied a creative vanguard off of his beloved creation. Cambot Jr., go ahead and fire up the breakdown footage. But, Commander Dan, the prequels are at the very least better than the Disney versions of Star Wars, especially that Mary Sue Ray. <laughs> Am I right? Uh, right, Commander Dan? Uh, I'll just start the next bit. Oh, look at this. This is Angry Joe. 
this is other Joe and Alex. I like these guys. They're involved in tabletop gaming, and they made one of the funniest takes on Last of Us 2 I ever saw on the internet. They're also a little too scared to put out a take that differs from what they imagine the red letter media take will be. Don't even throw out a take that's even a bit past the trolling that Mike Stoklas and his crew do. And the most pathetic part of it is this. Ray is a Mary Sue. Let me paint you a portrait of a true Mary Sue. This is C-3PO. He's a cock-blocking protocol droid who's hilarious, terrified of danger, loyal to his friends, and sucks in equal measure as to how much I'd be wrecked if 3PO was ever destroyed. He speaks bocce and six million other forms of communication. Next slide, Kambot Jr. This is Malastair, home of the Malastair 100 pod race. A 100-lap amateur race, it's deadly, in machines with top speeds of nearly 1,000 kilometers per hour. That's a nut hair under Mach 1. The speed of sound in open-air pod racers over terrain including poisonous gas clouds. Pod racer pilots regularly die in attempting to participate in this amateur race. Human pilots are unable to compete as they don't have the neurological synapses able to participate. Next slide, Cambot. This is the droid control ship of the Trade Federation. It's protected by vulture droids, droids that are also fighter planes, basically. Filled with little pods that have tiny little saw blade evil machines in them. Nearly 2,000 vulture droids. Anyone going up against these would have to be insanely gifted as a pilot. We're talking 10 times Poe Dameron, who is the greatest pilot ever. And with good reason. And this is a goddamn eight-year-old slave boy. I'm a person, and my name is Anakin. Oh, sorry. He's also a civil rights leader. This is Anakin Skywalker. He created C-3PO out of garbage. He won the Boonta Eve pod race. That's not just the NASCAR 500. That's a Grand Prix, a race where people really do die. In a car he created out of garbage. He destroyed the droid control ship of the Trade Federation while on autopilot with a droid who was not programmed to fly fighter planes when he was fucking eight years old. This little dipshit made a race car out of garbage and won the Space Grand Prix out of fucking garbage. Meanwhile, this is a real eight-year-old. Now, if there is a Mary Sue, you ought to power dump your pampers over, kids. It's Anakin, I hate sand, motherfucking Skywalker. Now, this is the end of your Mary Sue bullshit in terms of Star Wars, by the way. So mourn that shit. I know, you have to let go of a kind of trite, sexist, chauvinist thing. Unsub if you want to. But while you're walking away, know that you have some soul-searching as to why you're pissed about the character of Rey being a Jedi and being skilled. It rhymes with sexism, by the way. It's sexism. It's just sexism. It's chauvinist bullshit, really. But it's not only that. However, if you stay around, all right, I'll attempt to give you an understanding and we can mend your broken heart and our disagreement here. And you won't agree with me because you think this comes from an insincere, woke place or some weak, I want to please everyone nonsense. It comes from a sincere love of Star Wars and more, a grown-ass man's understanding of the rules of Star Wars. Only sexist lizard brain retards will have left by now. Are you all gone? Have you left? Good. All right, here's a secret. This is a secret answer why Ray irritates you if you're not one of those idiots. Because as much as J.J. Abrams knows how to shoot a movie like another director, he doesn't seem to understand why things are done a certain way. This is the poster for Star Wars. And The Empire Strikes Back. And The Return of the Jedi. Notice something? When you see a lightsaber, it's being held by Luke or Vader. It's not being held by Lando. Not by Han or Leia. C-3PO. It's not being held by Watto or anyone else who isn't a Jedi. 
Here's the fact. The rule is the posters do not lie to the people going to the movie. There's no mystery box with who's holding a lightsaber. The one holding the lightsaber is a goddamn Jedi. But this wasn't made by George Lucas. All of the Force Awakens bullshit marketing indicated that we were not only going to have a black protagonist, but a black Jedi as the focus of the series. Even the actor playing Finn believed there was going to be more to his story than there is. And here's the sad part. Watch him reacting to the trailer. Look at his friends. Look at him. Even he thought this was going to expand, if not just Rey. It would be Rey and Finn coming up as Jedi. There would be more Jedi. There was an awakening in the Force. But the real criminal sin of J.J. and Disney's necromancy of Star Wars after George Lucas let it die? This poster. It lies. To our faces. For the sake of an Act 2 twist that it doesn't earn. And makes everyone fooled by that lie look for shit to see as proof of them not being fooled. Everyone wants to be the smartest person in the room these days. And because the marketing chose to lie rather than keep everything a secret, that was George's way, Everyone needs to feel like they weren't idiots to trust Disney with their love of Star Wars. But we all were. We were dummies to think that Disney were anything but what George called them. Not necessarily the sin of slavery, but they do take properties and just milk them like, I don't know, abusive cattle farmers. And it's not Ray's fault, you know, the character. She's not Mary Sue and she wasn't written that way. And by the by, neither is Anakin. Please understand that my... Sincere opinion is that even at eight years old, they're both, whether by the plan of George Lucas or the weird alchemy a leaderless Star Wars under Disney's cruel necromancy produced, versions is in the Force. And I guess that by the end of the first movie, I was like, oh my God, she's either created by Palpatine as like a clone of someone, or she's like an amalgamation of Mara Jaden and Leia in the in the post uh, A New Hope series. But I wasn't mad at it because I understood. Because here's the fucking facts, people. I'm a fan of Star Wars. I love Star Wars, and I've been a fan for 40 years. This is a grown man telling you. So, I have wisdom, and I have partaken upon it, and I've given it to you. Wisdom that only an old, decrepit lover of Star Wars could give you. So believe me when I say, I have Star Wars reasons for liking the title or evaluating today. My opinions were based on an understanding of Star Wars, and I will not abide people saying shit like in red letter media to me because those are jokes about something I love that killed the thing I love so it's a very hard place to be but we're going to get into it we're going to evaluate this title let's go All right. I hope that didn't hurt too much I mean it breaks brains sometimes when people have to think for themselves and question everything. Today we're evaluating Phantom Menace for the PlayStation because I don't want to. I want to take a look at Star Wars, you know, for act for Action Movie Month to round it out. And I want to take a movie that not everyone loves, and I want to take a licensed game that breaks the trend of the game being terrible as well as the movie. And so, anyway. My disdain for modern fandom and my tolerance for things like Star Wars that I love, you know, so long as they follow Star Wars' internal rules, I'm okay with it. Even the new movies, I'm, I'm kind of okay with. Even though, technically, because we were so successful in running good old George away from Star Wars, they're just fan fiction. Let's get into it. It came about Junior. Yeah, boss? Sorry I was a dick. I was trying to make a point. Oh, it's okay, boss. You're only human. Thanks. That wasn't a compliment, boss. I had that coming. Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace by LucasArts and Big Ape Productions for the Sony PlayStation came out in September of 1999. As part of the hype licensing machine for the flick, and it was a big part of the reason diehard fans like myself felt more involved with the movie. The other reasons were the novelization for the movie, Darth Maul's revelation, in some of those books, and, you know, let's speak plainly here. The truth is, as messy as the prequels ended up, I have fond memories of waiting with my friend Steve in line. I saw it three times in the theaters overall, my favorite being at Universal City Walk, where my buddy Steve and I 
walked out of there looking exactly like George Lucas was <laughs> terrified of happening in the in, in the documentary that uh, that the Plinkett reviews dissect and use against that movie so hard. Like, George went too far in some places. He was worried that that was what he did. He also said that if Jar Jar doesn't work on screen, then the movie falls apart. He's far too funny a, a character. He's too goofy a character. But he created a goofy character to be like the Ewoks. Anyway. What I saw in Steve was that the movie was far too a stretch in many directions, in tone, in content, and without familiar handholds like the Millennium Falcon or ATSTs, ATSTs. Now, if I could find and talk to Rich Evans, I would say that shit was some of the funniest shit I ever saw. And it makes me feel really, really, really seen as a fan of Star Wars because I was like that when I saw Rogue One's trailer. So happy to see familiar Star Wars again because we weren't seeing it in The Force Awakens, really. There's just drops and dollops, but not like, hey, this takes place during that time, you know. But when Steve and I left that theater, Steve, and he is a dedicated Star Wars fan, he was standing there like he just barely escaped an exploding badger. Excited, relieved, confused. But another one of our friends named his son Anakin. I know, cringe, right? But that's just to show you, not everyone hated that movie. And the hate seems to stem from this thing that I will label Macarena Syndrome. Macarena was a pretty popular tune in its day. And even if you did dance the Macarena when it was hot and out and in the clubs, and you did, if you were around when it was popular, you did. Weddings, birthdays, hell, car washes. Uh, you're at your grandma's house, it pops on, boom, you're popping off. Doing the Macarena because it was easy and it was fun. And then eventually it became not cool. So you pretended you hated it and would never want to be made fun of for following a popular thing ever again. You were so lucky because at that period, there weren't cameras on us all the time. We weren't recording each other to the status of oblivion. You couldn't be cyberbullied over dancing to the Macarena or being a fan of Star Wars forever. And the thing that Red Letter Media Plinkett reviews do best is mock the fans of Star Wars. The people nerding out at the premiere of Episode One is used to mock the fans. That's you, by the by, if you're a fan of Star Wars. That's me. And the simple fact is, hipsters hate fun. And like mocking sincerity and shaming people and not enjoying things they enjoy, hipsters get a little ironic pleasure because they believe themselves to be cynical in spirit but not in tone or reality. They're just realists. They're the hard-bitten truth-tellers of this world. They find themselves the George Carlin in a world of mind of Mencias. They're not. They're just assholes. And they killed Star Wars. Killed it. That's where I stand. That's why I'm talking about the prequels and this game. <laughs> Let's evaluate it, honestly and truthfully. So you'll know that my opinion on Star Wars games will also be truthful. I'm not going to lie to you. Let's start with the game itself. The game is a platforming action game starring Obi-Wan, Qui-Gon, and has side levels playing as Amidala and Panaka as well. The game follows the plot of the movie, basically, but adds a couple missions where you play detective trying to locate a kidnapped or otherwise endangered Jar Jar, making sure you will be annoyed with Jar Jar whether you caught the movie or not. Jar Jar is the worst thing about that movie, and it all stems from one thing. Gibberish. Jar Jar speaks in a pidgin English. And all of the aliens, except for Jabba, and even the two-headed guys at the Boon to Eve race, speak in pidgin English, an accented English that sounds like racial stereotypes. Even Greg Proops, one of the whitest men on the planet, and Tom Kenny, the other head at that race, whitest guy when he's not playing the yellowest guy on the planet. Speaking in a language that makes it sound kind of racist. It sounds racist. Because they didn't follow the gibberish rule that George didn't set up. Ben Burt set that up. Along with 
basically the editors of the movie in the 70s who were hi highly sensitive to racial things and you'd never have somebody speaking this like tobago pigeon english as the gungans speak being like fish people who are kind of jamaican you wouldn't do that you would do something like else the nemoidians are performing a blockade and they're like a naval culture that's also sneaky and uh are the trade federation look man there's no easy way to say this lucas's ideas are based on the 40s that was a world war ii thing that happened and the japanese did do blockades so had he not done what he originally did and instead did this Bantapudu. That would have been the movie would have been fine if Jar Jar spoke like instead of actual English, broken up like you hear in some minstrel show. It would have been fine, right? Okay, that's it about Jar Jar. We've all talked to death about Jar Jar. Jar Jar sucks because of that, in my opinion. The rest of it's fine. It was, it's little kitty shit to make people happy. And it failed because it was baby stuff. It was baby caca poopy. Back to the game. The game plays out over about five hours or so of action, basic early Zelda puzzle type stuff, and interesting extras like a baby job of the hut, doing pod racer pilots dirty, like assassinating odds on favorites from the amateur leagues. And all of this is interesting because George Lucas himself had an actual love of racing and Formula One cars. And basically, gangsters and people from it, from our real world did exactly the things that Jabba does in this video game. And the things that happened in that movie. Sebulba was very much like many of the popular races in the 40s. This is all very much trying to portray a world reflecting our world in World War II. Honestly. And I wonder how much of the game was suggested by George Lucas himself. Again, we follow the beats of the film in the game, and while there's some sidesteps, let's look at the levels and go over the good, the bad, oof, and the ugly. And no, it's not the graphics. It was a PS1 game, come on. We're following along with the plot of the film. The first level is the Jedi escaping from the Trade Federation ship, and is what you'd expect from a top-down action game of that time. Using a lightsaber, pushing switches, destroying Federation droids, and running from droidicas, you escape to the second level, which is the surface of Naboo. You head to Otogunga, the Gungan city, and rescue Jar Jar. This becomes a running theme from his well-deserved prison sentence for being Jar Jar, and you get to blow off steam by slaying some Gungans, or at least knocking them over, and you make your way to the following levels, which are pretty fun. Theed Gardens is just a battle stage, then to Tatooine for a stretch, a long stretch, but it's fun. And then you go to Coruscant. Now, on Tatooine, you are playing as Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan, and you have that a, a really quick but fun battle against Darth Maul and his um, probe droids. So it's not bad. It's just really long. And finally, the game culminates after Coruscant, where you play a little bit as Amidala and a little bit as Panaka, and then you get to the Battle of Naboo. If I recall correctly, you play as Panaka. I'm not sure if you play as Amidala, as I'm thinking about it. And I played a bit of this, and man... I didn't get as far as Naboo before having to finish up the episode, basically. Now, on Naboo, the Jedi face off with Darth Maul, and it wraps up with a pre-rendered 3D FMV sequence from the movie. All of the FMV sequences from this game are pre-rendered 3D, which seems cheap, in my opinion, especially when compared to our last evaluation, Enter the Matrix. I mean, look at this. Oh, shut up, Jar Jar. <laughs> All right. Levels and graphics for the time are good, for the time. The bad? This game seriously drags. Just so many fetch quests, button find missions, and busy work, and conversations with every alien who ever lived in every town on every planet of the galaxy. Here's an also good? The levels are well thought out and really neatly choreographed for the action that you're, that you're portraying. Um, the sound and graphics in these levels match up with the movies. A lot of the sound is Lucasfilm Foley, so that's kind of cool. The ugly? Well, it's everything that surrounds this license that I have to get off my chest. 
I've been a fan of this since I was a little kid. This innocent little guy. And Red Letter Media, with their first major blow, I guess, or first major victory, was the Death Star destroying Alderaan. They didn't have to destroy Star Wars, but they did, and they don't care. And they go on to do it. And they're trying against everything. I just warn people, remember that these guys don't like anything. Or won't like anything that isn't ironically shit. They hated the prequels. They love Neil Breen. Because he's terrible. And they'd rather wallow in it, world of shit and mediocrity, so that when they make shit and mediocrity, it doesn't stand out so much, because they're terrified of trying to stand out. I don't have their money. I don't have their clout. I don't even have their presence on the internet. All I have is my sad, old, fanboy, man-child feelings about Star Wars, which they killed. They forced, they bullied and forced George Lucas to quit. And there you have it. But we only have one question left before us. And it's the only important question when it comes to my show. And that question is, does Phantom Menace for the PlayStation have a license to play? Answer? No. The games for these movies, a lot like the movies themselves, stumble towards goodness, if not greatness. And while I love this game, convincing anyone else to love the game the way I do, or the movies the way that I do, is just a futile gesture on my part. It's a bridge too far, honestly. I just I just really have to say I do like that game a lot. And while there are probably fans of it just like myself, it's not enough to give it a license to play universally. Now, we're not done with the galaxy far, far away. Not by a damn sight, okay? We got a couple more titles back here in the old retro station that I want to take a look at. And, you know, we've got, well, we start uh, next month's theme. And I believe Margot had something she wanted to tell me about that. Now, if you can guess what we're going to review, give your answer below. You'll have to watch to the end of the episode to kind of figure it out. But Margo insists that she has a true challenge for Commander Dan and all the space pirates at the retro station. And, you know, if you guess correctly, you get a no prize. You can ask Stuttering Stick or you can ask Drake Red about what a no prize is. They're pretty freaking sweet. <laughs> And what is that really, honestly? Well, a no prize is not a prize. I, I don't think I could legally call anything I would give you guys a prize. But it's a care package from the retro station. Basically, of stuff I need to offload to make room for more stuff for the collection. In fact, if you come over to Twitch, um, I do um, pick up videos over there now. And I do streaming. So it's just Retro Station 1989 over there. And if you like it, hang around. Subscribe. Whatever else. I don't know. Follow me. I don't know. I don't know how Twitch works. I don't have that many people following me over on Twitch, to be honest. Nor do I have people following me here. Well, we're not going to be sad about that. Because... That's right. This time around, April is going to be... Take it away, boys. Sci-fi month! Oh! oh my God! God. That's a speed laser, Gatling laser. And Margo, I will take up the gauntlet that you've thrown down. All right? A lot of other people might have an opinion on that game, but I will break the internet with my evaluation, and we will see if a truly legendarily epic challenge of a game to review has a license to play. But in the meantime... We're going to celebrate Sci-Fi Month. That's April. That's my birth month. Please do so along with my boys. Continue. Follow that connection down below with that little linky-poo. And subscribe to their channel if you haven't already. I mean, it's all the cool kids are doing. And last but not least, more than anything I've said in this video about Star Wars, know that I don't hate your opinion. And I, I fully value the fact that you have one. Just remember that my opinion's right. And also remember, more than any of that nonsense... Remember to always, always, always 
stay retro. Peace. Get upset on the internet. You're a salt adult. You're a salt adult.